If you are anything like me, um, perhaps you find yourself looking about right now and feeling overwhelmed by the unrest of our world. At times, situations look dismal, from the nation's capital to the nation's courtroom to the nation's churches and so on. Sometimes it just feels like we're spiraling out of control. A. W. Tozer said, if biblical Christianity is to survive the present upheaval in our world, we need a fresh revelation of the greatness and the beauty of Jesus Christ. Church, for that to happen, we must be given much to prayer. Dr. Curtis Hudson said, there is more you can do after you pray, but there is nothing you can do until you pray. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of those about me seemed insufficient for the day. E.M. Bounds said, what the church needs today is not new organization or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men mighty in prayer. The story is told of two women doing their laundry in the laundromat. Both had some clothes tumbling in the dryer, and as they waited, they were sewing their husband's pants. One wife told the other, my husband seems so miserable. Nothing is going right at work. Our home life is waning. Whenever we go to church, she complains about the songs that we sing and the pastor and his message. The second wife responded, I'm so sorry to hear that. My husband has begun now to find much delight in life. In fact, our home life has never been more pleasant, and he looks forward now to the church service each week. And suddenly it became quiet in the laundromat and the women continued to sew their husband's pants. The first woman who spoke was patching the seat of her husband's pants and the other woman was patching the knees. Healing in our families, healing in our churches, healing in our communities, healing in our nation will only happen if we are given much to prayer. One man given much to prayer was Nehemiah. And so as we continue in our series, 66 books, 66 messages, that's where we fall today. Nehemiah, and I'm going to be reading from the first chapter to begin with, at chapter 1. This is the word of our God. Nehemiah 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him, and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws your servant, of your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. 
They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength, your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So ends the reading of God's word at this portion of our time. The book of Nehemiah opens in chapter 1 with Nehemiah praying. And the book of Nehemiah ends in chapter 13 with Nehemiah praying. Dispersed everywhere within this book is, you guessed it, Nehemiah praying. Bible commentator Mark Thornfeet suggests that Nehemiah's turning to God as the source of strength in all aspects of life is one of his most attractive qualities. Let me ask, when people observe us, what would they say exists as our most attractive qualities? Would prayerfulness be one of them? Are we given much to prayer? Many Israelites had returned to Jerusalem, and they had returned in order to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And during this time, Nehemiah had remained in Susa as the cupbearer of the king, and one of his brothers and a few other men had returned to tell him about the troubled state of the remnant that had gone back to Jerusalem. It seemed like things were spiraling out of control. It is safe to say that spiritual apathy did not characterize Nehemiah. His name in Hebrew means the Lord has comforted. And Nehemiah's name fit him. The Lord comforted others through him because he genuinely cared for people. Nehemiah was personally invested in the plight of his fellow Jews, and he wanted to know how they were doing. This is someone who looked you in the eye and asked you how you were doing and actually cared about what you said. You see, I'm Southern. I, I don't mean to speak negatively of my heritage. I love my heritage. But there's something about the South that is true. You'll be walking along and you'll see someone you know and you'll say, hey, how are you doing? And the truth is, you don't want to know. <laughs> the truth is, is, the response you're looking for is, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine too, see you later. But you see, that's not who Nehemiah was. My wife's best friend from college was a Nehemiah soul. When Kelsey asked how you were doing, she really wanted to know. Plus, if she asked how, if, if you asked how she was doing, she would tell you the honest truth. And Brooke recalls when people would tell Kelsey, well, I'll pray for you. She would quip, will you really? Don't say it if you're not going to do it. A takeaway point is that we should care enough about others to ask how they are doing, to actually want to know, and then to pray for those who have needs. Are we given much to prayer? Let us not be spiritually apathetic. Let us faithfully pray one for another. Comparing chapter 1 and verse 1 with chapter 2 and verse 1, which we will read later, we find that Nehemiah set aside time to pray daily for the Hebrew people in their distress. Nehemiah was not too tired. He was not too busy to pray. It is safe to say that spiritual laziness did not characterize Nehemiah. Part of an anonymous poem called Into the Day 
reads like this. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I didn't have time to pray. Troubles just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. In a graduation speech at Dillard University, actor Denzel Washington charged the graduates to put God first. And I love this part of the speech. He told them, take your bedroom slippers and slide them far underneath your bed so that when you get up in the morning, you have to get down on your knees to pull them out. And while you're down there, why don't you pray? Put God first. For those who might say, I'd like to pray more, but it just doesn't come naturally for me. Well, the model prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 1 provides, I think, a good structural example. You can make a case that it follows the acronym of ACTS, which stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. When we pray, we should begin by acknowledging who God is. That amounts to the A for adoration. It's what we see in verse 5. When teaching his disciples how to pray, Jesus told them to begin by saying what? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The psalmist says we should declare, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And Nehemiah says, great and awesome God. Our adoration of God, after all, puts everything in perspective. Whenever we exalt God for who he is, our problems all of a sudden take on a more manageable dimension. Next, we should openly repent of our sin. That amounts to the C for confession, which we see in verses 6 through 9. Evangelist Gypsy Smith, when asked what the secret of revival was, said, go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself, then pray, O oh Lord, revive everything that's in this circle. When the Times of London asked several authors to answer the question, what's wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton responded by writing a very short letter, dear sirs, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. We could learn much from Smith and Chesterton, but sadly the truth is we are far better at identifying what's wrong with everyone else and too often fail to spend adequate time confessing what's wrong with us. Then we should remember how good God has been to us. That amounts to the T for Thanksgiving, which we see in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 4, verse 2, keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. He also says in Ephesians 5, verse 20, always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Nehemiah's prayer, he gives thanks for God's faithfulness and for God's redemptive deliverance during the time of the Exodus. How much more, regardless of the difficulties we might find ourselves walking through, should we stop and say thank you because of Jesus' deliverance at Calvary? Finally, we should freely and lavishly present our requests before the throne of grace. That amounts to the S for supplication. And that's what we see in verse 11. The story is told about a king holding a meeting with other stately men within his throne room. 
when suddenly a young boy burst through the doors without any regard and a guardsman tried to stop him, shouting, Stop! Else you disturb the king. The boy responded, He's more than just my king. He's my daddy. And he promptly bounced into the arms of his father. Friends, that too is our story if we have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. That too is the position we have with God. Yes, he is our king, but he's also our daddy. And we have free access to the throne of grace night and day. We can ask of him whatever it is we need. In fairness, Nehemiah did not set down to pray an acronym of Acts. It is simply an example of something that we could follow. The main point, however, is that we take time to pray. Let us not be spiritually lazy. Max Licato says, our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears and not in the one who says it, our prayers can make a difference. Let me ask you again, are we given much to prayer? Nehemiah asked the Lord to give him personal success, but this was not for any selfish end. This was not out of pride. No, Nehemiah's supplication is for God to somehow use him for the good of God's people. The start of chapter 2 reveals the dialogue that eventually takes place between the king and his cupbearer. So I want to read now with us Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Pay attention here. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. During the four months between the time when Nehemiah heard of Jerusalem's condition and the time in which she addresses the king, it may have been that, A, the king was at another place of his royal residence, or B, that another cupbearer had been serving him, or C, Nehemiah had just not been given an opportune moment to broach his concern with the king. We cannot know what we know is that Nehemiah had to wait for an invitation before he could share his burden with the king. Conversely, what we know is that God's children can go anytime before the king of kings. But when our text Xerxes asked Nehemiah what he wanted, the text reports that Nehemiah prayed. So Artaxerxes says, what is it you want, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah did this. <laughs> of course not. We know he didn't take 15 minutes to go over and pray somewhere. What we know, however, is that he prayed. I think his prayer went something like this. Lord, please give me the words. And he spoke. Impromptu prayers like this don't just occur. They are the result of living life in God's presence. 
Nehemiah prayed this way because he was always praying this way. Billy Graham once said, true prayer is a way of life, not just for use in cases of emergency. Make it a habit, and when the need arises, you will be in practice. Martin Luther once suggested that we begin our day saying, dear God, and we end it by saying, amen. And everywhere dispersed in between, guess what? We're engaged in prayer. It is safe to say that spiritual pride did not characterize Nehemiah. People approaching the throne of Persia had to be very careful what they said, lest they anger the king. And if they did, there was a reason why Nehemiah says he was afraid. As an aside, isn't it great that God's people can tell our God whatever burdens we have? without fear. Nehemiah asking to rebuild the city wall of Jerusalem was no small matter. He is asking the same king. Go back and read Ezra chapter 4. He's asking the same king who had actually stopped the building of the wall for permission to go back and rebuild it. That's no small matter. In fact, the king very well could have perceived it as some political ploy on the part of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah realized something. He realized that success did not rest within himself. His success before this Persian ruler hinged completely on the mercies of the king of kings. It is mercy that Nehemiah received. For as you continue to read, we find that two months after gaining Artaxerxes' permission, Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. A young company president instructed his secretary daily not to disturb him during a set important appointment. However, when the chairman of the board came, he demanded to see him. And the secretary said, I'm sorry, sir, the president of the company is not available. And the chairman of the board says, he's available to me. He became angry. He flew open the door only to see the corporation's president on his knees in prayer. He softly closed the door. He looked back at the secretary and he said, is this usual? And she said, yes, sir. He keeps that appointment every morning. And the chairman of the board replied, it's little wonder that our company has become so successful. Where do we place our confidence for success? Let me ask again. Are we given much to prayer? Let us not be overtaken by any sense of pride. Instead, let us be a church of Nehemiahs. Let us be a church who knows where our hope resides, not in our own resourcefulness, but solely upon the mercies of the King of Kings. Leonard Ravenhill sums it up like this. One might estimate the weight of the world, might tell the size of the celestial city, count the stars of heaven, measure the speed of lightning, and tell the time of the rising and the setting of the sun, but you cannot estimate prayer power. Prayer is so vast because God is behind it. And prayer is so mighty because God has committed himself to answer it. I began this morning alluding to troubling situations in our world. Perhaps it seems like the walls are torn down and the cities are afire. But take comfort 
dear Nehemiahs, nothing is outside the control of God. And he hears our prayers. But are we given much to prayer? May the knees of our pants need to be re because our bed slippers are so far under the bed that we call upon God at the start of every day. And we lean upon God through the moments of our days. And we end our days in the presence of our King. Because he cares and he invites us into his presence that we would not be lazy and we would not be too proud. Let us enter into a time of prayer and ask that God would use us as Nehemiah's. Pray together. Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Great and mighty God, I confess my sin, my sin which is many, I repent and ask, Lord God, that you would shape me into the man you want me to be. Into the father you call me to be. I pray for our nation. I pray for homes and families to return to that time where they weren't too busy to gather together and pray. I pray for a nation that's healed from all that divides it. I call out to you, Christ Jesus, because you alone can redeem it all. Lord, our Savior, we give you thanks. And we pray for strength to go before those with whom we encounter and that we ask for your mercies to be performed, perhaps in their lives, perhaps in the lives of others, but that we would be part of rebuilding these streets that need mending and that we would be a part of seeing the walls rebuilt. The walls of your church being filled again with people desiring to sing your praises. Go before us Christ Jesus, even when there is one who stands night and day to accuse us, go before us, stand with us, intercede on our behalf night and day, embolden us for your purposes. Christ be glorified through this church and your people, we pray. Amen. The altar is open. Maybe you just want to come, not to speak to me, but to pray. Whatever decision you need to make, today is a good day to respond. And stand together as we worship.